So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for a discussion on RBL Bank's financial results for the first quarter of FI21. I am joined on this call by other members of our management team who, along with me, will address any questions that you all may have later. The last quarter was a mixed bag. On the one hand, COVID infection rates increased across the country, causing partial lockdowns to be reimposed in certain states. And the, the conference is now being recorded. On the other hand, as we transitioned from a strict lockdown to various stages of unlocking and easing, we saw an improvement in economic activity begin in May 2020 with a sharp lift in June as the majority of the country went into unlocked phase. The economic forecasts point to a contraction in the FY 2021 GDP of anything between a 5 to 8% range. And while the government and RBI have announced a slew of measures, growth, according to us, is expected to come back only in the fourth quarter. As articulated in our last call, the rural economy was the first to see a bounce back. As soon as the process of unlocking began, small businesses started and the agriculture-related activities witnessed a robust growth. The infection levels, however, continued to remain, the infection levels continued to remain low and the government stimulus in terms of direct cash transfers and Manrega helped. For us, this was quite positive for our rural inclusion and agribusiness. However, we, we believe that the overall economic recovery will likely be incremental as labor availability, low demand, and location-specific restrictions will constrain businesses from reaching their pre-COVID levels in the near future. As a bank, we therefore continue to remain focused on balance sheet. In terms of risk mitigation, in terms of capital conservation, and in terms of maintaining surplus liquidity. We've had a satisfactory quarter from a profitability perspective. However, as an important prudential measure, we have significantly increased our PCR by over 6% to 70.5% now, and have taken additional COVID-related provisions also. At an operation level, of course, our employees continue to work tirelessly, despite localized interruptions in some areas caused by the pandemic, and have ensured that all our operations are run smoothly and at almost full capacity. I'll now briefly talk about our performance highlights for the quarter. Advances were flat year on year and declined 2% sequentially from the previous quarter. The retail wholesale advances mix is now 53.47. Our wholesale business declined 18% year on year, 3% sequentially. As we continue debulking, de risking, and right sizing our portfolio, in, in line with our target operating model. Non-wholesale businesses grew 24% year on year. Our total deposits grew 7% sequentially to 61,736 crores. Deposit traction has continued to remain strong throughout this quarter, leading to a further increase in our surplus liquidity position, which now stands at 13,600 crores at present. Our LCR averaged 164% for the quarter. We expect this to gradually unwind as our risk appetite on lending in retail and wholesale segments comes back, hopefully, in the next few quarters. Meanwhile, we have focused on reducing cost of deposits, increasing granularity, and, and, and that leads to a reduction in cost of deposits by 13 basis points to 6.27% in this quarter. 
we have recently cut our rates on both term and saving deposits further and we expect the cost of deposits to come down to trend even lower in the coming quarter casa deposits grew 18% year on year and 8% sequentially casa percentage crossed 30% for the first time and was at 30.1% in q1 21 as against 25.8% in the same time last year revenue growth saw some impact owing to lockdown etc but despite that we have grown 6% year on year in q1 21 nims continue to be strong at 4.85% for the quarter net interest revenue was 1041 crores a growth of 27% year on year other income of course declined 31% year on year primarily because of lower credit offtake conservative risk appetite and and reduction in credit card income our cost to income ratio was 49.8% for the quarter cost did have the benefit of a lower variable costs as the retail loan origination was subdued moreover we have also initiated a process of cost rationalization our pre provision operating profit grew 14% year on year to 690 crore as a result of the above and after taking necessary provisions at for the quarter was 141 crore now to touch upon the moratorium situation as of june 30th 2020 for the bank the overall book under moratorium is now at 13.7% as of june 30th as against 33% in our last quarterly update within this wholesale is at 5% as compared to 22% as last reported in the wholesale book we have seen a sharper reduction because of multiple reasons including the fact that many customers who initially thought they needed it decided against availing more at as well as customers who were given conditional approval at the time deciding against it the more at in our non wholesale business is approximately 30% in micro banking as rural markets have increased increasingly returned to some semblance of normalcy we have seen collections improve to an almost 77% level and a uh, sorry i'll say that again we have seen collections improve so now almost 77% of our customers have started paying their emi in july in credit cards approximately 11% of our customers constituting a little under approximately 21% of advances are under morat we have again in this quarter taken some covid related provisions in the on the retail portfolio which we will discuss a little later coming to asset quality our gross npa was at 3.45% as against 3.62% at the end of the last quarter so there was a decline our net npa was down to 1.65% as against 2.05% in q4 fy20 which means a bigger decline due to higher provisioning along with an increase in pcr as such in this quarter as a strong prudential measure we raised our pcr by 6.4% to 70.5% as of q1 2020 which is approximately an amount of 250 crores of additional pcr related provision <clears throat> we've also taken another 240 crores of additional provisions on account of covid this is in addition to the 110 crore provision we took in fourth quarter 2020 so a total of 350 crores of covid related provisions have now been taken which 
translates to approximately 63 basis points of our advances book. A majority of this provisioning is towards our credit card portfolio, where we have provided for approximately 10% of the credit card, credit card book under Murat. In our estimate, we are on track to remain within the credit cost guidance we had given earlier for FI21, and that too of remaining at or within the FI20 levels. On our capital position, we ended the quarter with a comfortable capital adequacy ratio of 16.35% and with a CET ratio of 15.2%. I will now hand over to Harjit my, to talk you through our non-wholesale businesses in some more detail. Thank you, sir, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I will now give you the highlights for the quarter and the operating system amongst our different businesses in the non-wholesale segment. In our micro-banking business, almost all our branches are open with over 90% staff in attendance and client center meetings are happening regularly in areas where there are no restrictions on movement. Over 95% of center meetings are now in person or on phone. In our business loan segment, we noticed that the MSME businesses in the market were slow to pick up, as expected and mentioned by us in our May call. While the supply chains have opened up, the businesses are facing twin challenges of low demand and disruption in the regular operations because of restrictions. The moratorium has helped the MSME segment the most as it has just deferred their EMIs and elongated the tenor of the loan, while not changing the EMI amounts. The recently announced credit guarantee scheme is also enabling these businesses to raise cheap debt in order to kickstart their businesses. We have sanctioned around 225 crores of loans and disbursed 192 crores under the credit guarantee scheme of the government. All these have been given to good, strong businesses that were in good shape before the lockdown and need assistance in the post-lockdown scenario. For the individual segment, we have seen some amount of confidence restored, though the health care is still there. Based on our collections feedback, we haven't seen much signs of large-scale job loss in our client segment. But we have observed salary delays or cuts in some instances. However, the sentiment continues to remain cautious amongst this segment with a strong bias for cash preservation on account of the uncertain future. In our credit card segment, we were wary of an increase in the number of customers availing moratorium with the extension of moratorium and lockdown. However, we are happy to report that the moratorium has in fact reduced from 24% to 21% by value. Around 11% of our card customers and number are in moratorium now. 58% of the customers in Murat 1 moved into Murat 2. However, 25% of these have already moved out. Today, 60% of customers in Murat 2 pool are therefore from Murat 1, indicating that there is a lot of churn in customers under moratorium, and hence not everything is sticky. 70% of this customer base is salaried, same proportion as the portfolio. Further, 95% never have been delinquent in the preceding six months. For clarity, let me spell out the definition of moratorium. We define moratorium as balances of customers who've not made a payment to us in June, irrespective whether they opted in for moratorium or not. In fact, from July onwards, we have asked customers to apply specifically for moratorium. Only 38,000 customers applied. However, Payment has not been received from about 3.2 lakh customers. For us, that is the moratorium pool and not the 38,000, which is 11% of our customer base. This is the pool which we need to collect from. Let me now talk a little about customer spend. We have seen pickup in spend from May onwards, and for the month of June, spends were at 78% of March levels. July has even been better than June, and as of date, we are at 84% spend as compared to March. However, we are seeing some variations happen, especially in the last two weeks, as more and more cities go back into complete or partial lockdown. Let me now talk about the new business origination. We had taken a conscious call not to book any new business for April and May. We started new business in a very, very cautious manner only mid-June. 
In micro banking, we did not disburse new loans as we wanted to see one full month of pure collections to judge the situation on the ground and ability to pay by the clients without any promise of new disbursals, including emergency loans. Since July, we have started disbursing in centers where we are seeing regular collections. We will start increasing our pace of new business in the coming months as we get more comfortable with normalization of economic activity. However, we will wait for moratorium to end and at least a month of collections post that before we open all our acquisition channels. Therefore, we expect normal disbursal run rates only by around December 2020. Needless to say, our credit filters continue to remain extremely conservative and we are looking at every client in terms of their current cash flows, repayment on their existing dues across financiers, and a degree of certainty in terms of their future business. Let me now spend a little while on the business performance for quarter one FY21. Advances as mentioned for the non-wholesale business grew by 24% year on year with retail lending growing at 25% and DB and FI at 22% year on year. The growth is a reflection of the business already done by the end of quarter four FY20. On a sequential basis, the overall advances book degrew between two and a half to 3% quarter on quarter, as new business was shut for major part of quarter one. The yields on the overall non wholesale book further increased by 150 basis points year on year to 17%, primarily on account of the mixed change within the retail segment. Fee income in quarter one FY21 was down 41% year on year for the non-wholesale asset business and was lower than quarter four FY20 by 180 crores. Cards accounted for dominant part of the reduction in fee income, largely on account of no late payment charges and reduced interchange income on account of lower spends. The processing and annual fee were also down due to negligible new business plus lower EMI loans. The fee income, especially in credit cards, will pick up from September onwards once the moratorium ends. In credit cards, the total portfolio now stands at 2.7 million cards, flat to previous quarter. We took significant steps to bring down risk in our portfolio through limit reductions and blocking cards. We even blocked cards for customers who were in moratorium to cap our exposure to them. Our spend drop was lower than the market average as our customers continue to remain engaged with us and have also seen a bounce back in line with some of the larger players in the market. Our spends per account in June were at 7,450 rupees per month as against rupees 9,650 in March. The spend per active card was around 19,100 rupees, almost the same levels as quarter four, which is an encouraging sign. However, we did see a decline in our 30-day active rate, which was at 39% in June as against 53% in March. The active rate drop is on account of cautious spend behavior by some clients in these uncertain times, plus blocking of cards under moratorium. Adjusted for moratorium, we have a drop of around 5 to 6% in terms of active rate. We are seeing these numbers slowly rise every month in terms of the active rate. The collection build out is another thing which we focused on in the last quarter. As mentioned in the last call, we had proactively enhanced the capacity of our collections team by 1.6 times in anticipation of the build up in delinquency buckets once the moratorium ends. In fact, much of the capacity build out was already in place in May, as earlier the moratorium was to end by 30th of May. With the extension, the teams have now three more months to reduce the stocks till 31st of August. The opening of field collections in June has been a big help. Collection efficiencies have been increasing. In cards, we've also seen on-time payment rates move up to 84% of earlier level. Success is also visible in moving out customers from auditorium. The collection efficiency is further enhanced through advanced collection scorecard models, digital payment links, and interactive voice and chatbots. We have even seen our recovery channels operational in this tough environment and started to produce results on NP accounts. Our focus this quarter will be to reduce the opening bucket of September post the moratorium by as much as possible in the intervening period when the account DPDs are frozen because of the moratorium. In our micro banking business, the focus has been on branch uh, resumption of operations, ensuring safety of our staff and starting the discipline of center meetings. 
in June, as we said, you were able to hold almost about 95% of center meetings. While we explained the moratorium and the associated costs to the clients, we noticed the following. Client business activities had started since May and cash flows were improving with every passing week. Households engaged in agricultural activities were seeing cash flows come on account of robust crop and pick up in allied agri activities. Majority of the customers did not want to bear the additional interest burden due to moratorium and wanted to start paying. Therefore, despite 100% moratorium offered to all clients, 62% payments were collected against the full June month's demand. We also saw efficiency of collections pick up with every passing week in June, and the same has continued in July as well, with around 77% of the customers making payments. However, here again in the last two weeks, we have seen lockdowns restart in various forms, as many states, as in many states, the authority to announce and enforce lockdowns are now at the district levels, and some places at the panchayat levels are as well. This does cause some disruption in collection activities, and needs to be closely watched. We're also closely watching the flood situation emerge in Assam and a few districts of West Bengal and Bihar. The positive feedback is that one has not seen any type of mass behavior in terms of non-payment or call for loan waivers. To sum up, the portfolio performance and business metrics seem to be on the lines of our scenario model, built out earlier, and we are confident of coming within our business forecasts. We need to continue to watch the growth of the pandemic and the unpredictable nature of lockdown, which have the potential to disrupt any normalcy which we are trying to restore. I will now hand over to Mr. Vishwavir Ahuja for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Harjit, for that was uh, very elaborate. Overall, therefore, I want to emphasize on a few key thoughts as we navigate through these uncertain times. The focus of the board and the management team this year would be to preserve and continue to fortify the balance sheet. Ensure that asset quality outcomes in both wholesale and retail stay within guidance that we have provided. Focus on granularity on both sides of the balance sheet as already being evidenced in this quarter. And take the opportunity presented to become sharper on costs and efficiency of delivery. Focus on businesses where we believe that we have build scale and invest further capital and resources to acquire a market leading position over the next few years. And lastly, I want to say that as a management team, we have the experience gravitas and are capable and determined to ensure a successful outcome for the bank, irrespective of the nature of the challenge on hand. I will stop here and we will open up the call for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset while asking your question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We take the first question from the line of Manish Otswal from Nirmal Bang. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my first question on the, uh, given the focus on the balance sheet quality preservation, so are we looking to raise the capital also uh, 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 to uh, sail through this uh, tough period or the, we are sufficiently capitalized for the uh, at least one to two year perspective? Yeah, I think if you, uh, I think the way I'd like to answer that is that if you look at our current capital position, it is more than adequate. Uh, we are uh, maintaining a capital adequacy overall of uh, approximately 16.4% with a CT ratio of 15.2 uh, or 15.3%, which is more, more than adequate. The second thought here is that the way we are continuing to, in fact, uh, manage and remain profitable. We don't, we are not seeing any possibility of a capital depletion to happen, you know, uh, over the next few months or quarters, or whatever. I mean, in the sense, throughout this challenging period, we are uh, managing to uh, 
uh, as i suggested even that our even in terms of our total credit costs they should be within our so called last year levels and if we project out there there is no possibility we see of any capital depletion so in other sense there is no capital erosion possible in other words we'll maintain the 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 the, the more than adequate capital position so that sort of calls into question the the need and efficacy of any potential capital raise you know the environment being what it is there is no defensive need to do that but we'll keep we'll look at the environment and see you know and continue to evaluate that situation right sir the second question on the moratorium so uh, you uh, you made a comment very detailed comment about the moratorium the definition of moratorium so based on your uh, when you were uh, just rewind yourself from quarter 4 to uh, quarter 1 and uh, as is the moratorium trend so it is in line with your expectation or anything which is uh, abnormal which you would like to highlight to us no actually uh, uh, i would say that uh, uh, we are actually uh, positively surprised uh, on both wholesale and non wholesale in terms of the improvement in the moratorium situation uh at the time of our last sort of update or presentation in the first week of may i mean the number as we have said earlier was one third of the book and now it is down to you know 13 and a half or 13.7% overall and on on both sides wholesale and non wholesale come down significantly so on the wholesale side we were very confident that you know things will dramatically improve and we commented to run on that previously because lot of the belt tightening and de-risking and debulking had started 9 12 months ago uh, because of our last year's situation around the few corporate assets where we were facing stress so we started moving towards a much tighter operating model 12 months ago and we have been consistently you know you know uh, uh, tightening our risk filters and the overall this culture in the organization even beyond you know uh, its satisfactory nature so that as i said previously also we walked into this year fiscal year on a on a pretty clean corporate book so you know uh, we were confident that uh, uh, we were very well positioned uh, in terms of asset quality on the corporate side so and that is now bearing out even in terms of the morat percentages so so while positively surprised but not so surprised there on the wholesale side things were to improve and they look they look to have improved on the retail side i think as harjit uh, has amply uh, you know explained that the 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 segments in which we are you know uh, have shown very good improvement uh, particularly on the inclusion side agri side and also i would say on the card side which are our two biggest if i may say business segments on the retail side so you know that is an encouraging sign and while to be cautious this little bit of disruption of repeat lockdown and all that is of concern i mean these things if they continue to happen again and again that disruption will cause some level of uncertainty to continue but i think the overall trends are headed in the right direction thank you Yeah. Next question, please. Sure. Next yeah. Question. Thank. You. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Next question is from the line of Atsav Mitra from Falcon Edge Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, are there any specific pockets that you are particularly worried about? You know, uh, in the sense, do you see that uh, based on is in your sense uh is this close to the bottom and do we build from here uh, you know particularly when you look at the roas roas and the question on uh, capital requirement incrementally has already been addressed but uh, you know how should we think about the call it one and a half two year probably even a three year plan of the original guidance of call it uh, one and a half to 1.6 roa call it 15 to 18% roe are we still on track based on what you are seeing currently 
So I'll give you a very practical answer to this. We are not pushing for growth in the next three, four, five, six months. You know, the the kind of, uh, if I may say, uh, focus uh, on uh, our balance sheet uh, preservation, capital preservation, liquidity preservation that I've talked about is going to be very much the guiding principle for now. And I don't think, you know, uh, as a as a thoughtful, cautious, you know, uh, institution which has to take care of all its stakeholders, we should be thinking otherwise in an environment of, you know, remaining uncertainty. And I think the time for that will come and will hopefully come soon. Uh, yes, things, the, the, the virus situation has lasted longer. Uh, the peaking is just about happening in Mumbai, Delhi. It, whereas in other parts of the country, it is still increasing. And I don't think we should call an end to it and we should remain cautious. So in that sense, our hopes of a full revival have got pushed back, you know, by three, four months for sure. And which is why we are saying that perhaps by and large, that, that kind of growth perspective will come back perhaps closer to December. Yeah. And, and that is what all the experts in, in, the, in, in the country and in the world are also suggesting. Yeah. Based on the various trends. So, no, we are not looking for growth right now. Yeah. But we are positioned for growth. And, and I think that's the way to look at it, that we are extremely well positioned for growth. And as and when, and we are positioned for growth and we, as and when those opportunities start presenting themselves, I think we will be very, uh, uh, very uh, agile and ready to get off the block just in the way we are positioned. And I think that's the way to look at it. Now to answer the second part of your question. So, so in simple terms, we see the growth trajectory reviving closer to December of this year and perhaps not earlier. And in fact, in the next quarter, second quarter, we may see a similar flattish to minor down territory, you know, although in retail, you know, new business has started happening. And I think Harjit can elaborate on that. But overall, I would say that that trajectory will remain where it is. Beyond that, I think once the growth starts reviving, in terms of our overall metrics today, you know, and reaching the so-called benchmark metrics that we have talked about earlier and you just mentioned, our path to getting there will in fact be faster this time around because a lot of improvements have happened, you know, in the meantime, in terms of our operating and financial uh, ratios. Uh, and I think, uh, so as the growth and the top line starts reviving, you know, the, the, the more in terms of the, not so much in terms of just the net interest income, it is more in terms of the other income lines, which have been impacted more because of COVID. And once they also start reviving along with the growth on the top line, then I think with a, with a, with a pretty decent asset quality, going into the growth stage. I think therefore the provisioning that will be required in the future will come down dramatically and will have a direct impact on not just profitability, but also on all our return ratios, you know? So I would say that the path to reaching those benchmarks will be a lot better because of the tightening that has already happened in the meantime, you know, cost rationalization efforts have also started bearing fruit. So in a sense, we will be a much better organization coming out stronger on the other side, you know, to, to reach those goals and targets. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Amit Kumar Prem Chindani from UTI Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Just had a question on the Morat number for credit card. Uh, I think... Um, uh, he mentioned that uh, this 24% has moved to 21% and, and there has been a churn of around 42% of the Lear Morat customers paying. Is it right? That's correct. So 42% of the Morat 1 customers exited and 58% of the Morat 1 pool entered into Morat 2. So uh, just to uh, uh, reading on the numbers, so around 25 billion rupees of credit card loan took Morat in one. And of that, around thousand crore, thousand fifty has paid, have paid. 
uh, and so basically 14 1500 crores of this 1000 2500 are still to yet to pay right just yes, under morat so of the 2100 around 1400 are from morat 1 so uh, so let me just look at it this way if i look at the pool today which is around 2200 odd yeah. crores 60% of that so about 1200 uh, odd crores is roughly is from morat 1 but they either are from april or from may sure uh, um, so this 13 billion rupees of pool which are taking two morats um, how viable is taking a morat for these kind of customers and hence what can be uh, the credit cost estimate for these kind of customers who are taking six month morat for a loan product um, which is anywhere between 20% to 40% rate yeah so understand that the outstanding share are fairly low we are talking about you know average outstanding in the region of about 30000 40000 rupees uh, and therefore the interest burdens are not prohibitive from that point of view uh, while from a interest rate perspective they will they look but uh, in actual rupees they are not uh, having said that majority of the losses which will come will come from this pool uh, because what is left and is, is able to service are unlikely to go bad for the rest of the year uh, and therefore when we have said that credit cards could actually see a credit cost uh, increase by almost about 70 odd percent over its normal 5% level this is the pool which will result in that the only good thing or silver lining which we are seeing is that you know if i would have said that 85 90% of my morat 2 pool consists of morat 1 customers then i should be worried because that's a very sticky pool that is not the case here even when i said 58% entered murat 2 in july itself 25% of them have paid so you are seeing people come out and go in and come out and therefore the churn is there uh, but the reality is that yes we will see a credit cost increase and that will come from the murat pool itself and just to clarify you said 38000 or people have actually taken murat as compared to 3 lakh who have not paid and you have taken 3 lakh as the murat pool uh, while uh, if you look at a listed player uh, With a hundred percent card business, for that player the Murad number went down uh, quite sharply. So why is this divergence between your number and uh, the same industry someone else's number? Yeah, I think it's a question of how you define Murad. If I was to define Murad as saying that people who opted for it, then my Murad number in terms of number of customers would be thirty-eight thousand, all over two point uh, seven million customer base. That's it. Uh, which would be maybe. Yeah. One and a half to two percent. Uh, the way we define Murat is people who not paid and on on which you have to collect, and that is the reason why I said that I gave the definition at least from our point of view to clarify what the Murat is. Now different players will use different definitions, but uh, we wanted to be clear as to what are we saying. In terms of value, this thirty-eight thousand customers would be. proportionately the same see the average ticket sizes don't vary here this is a card product so they're all same okay and the uh, overall morat number is 21% by value that's right right because that i think in the call 13 and a half was mentioned somewhere no 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 that that is for the aggregate book of the bank the bank morat number is 13.7% by value by value card yes Okay, okay. So there was some some uh, confusion about whether it is twenty one percent by value. Then twenty one twenty two percent is just for the credit card. Twenty one percent is specifically for credit cards. What? Sure, sure. Excuse, excuse me. Can I clarify? Thirteen point seven five percent. Thirteen point seven percent for the bank as a whole. Sure. Thanks a lot, sir. Down down from thirty three. That's one parameter. Within that wholesale. 22 down to 5 and cards 24 down to 21 clear and sir just on the mfi number how do you classify morat under microfinance now zero customers who start paying their emi are out of morat customers who not paid their emi are in morat so customers in june who have paid their emi will be out and customers who have not paid their emi will be continue to be in morat and what is the morat number for microfinance 
So microfinance, when we said in June, it was about 35%. These are customers who have not paid. When we said in July, we've seen 77% of the customers paid, pay their EMIs and hence 100 minus 77 is what would be the Murad number if I was to let's say calculate for July. And this is opt-in uh, or opt-out yet? No, there is no I question don't... of opt-in here. So we we don't follow a principle of opt-in and therefore classifying Murad. See, in microfinance, you go meet customers, you explain the Murad, there are customers who come and pay you an installment, which means they are opting out of the Murad. And customers who don't pay you continue to be treated as opt-in, irrespective whether they've given a request to you or the request is simply in the form of not paying. I, th I think we want to emphasize this fact a little bit, that this is the most conservative view that should be taken. Okay? I mean, we are not pointing fingers at anybody else. We are saying this is the most conservative view that should be taken. We don't. We are not going by this opt-in, opt-out structure. As far as microfinance is concerned, we gave the Morat to 100% previously. It is those who have voluntarily come forward and paid are the ones that are out of Morat. Those, whether opt-in or not opt-in, those who have not paid automatically get treated from our point of view as Morat, which is why we are more confident about this number improving steadily and not necessarily becoming the so-called bad asset, you know, which is the natural implication, largely because we are not using that opt-in definition. If we were to reduce, use opt-in definition, the numbers would go down dramatically on our Morat, you know, and we don't want to therefore mislead anybody by using that kind of assessment of the situation. I hope we are amply clear about this. Sure, sir. Very clear. Thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Manish Karwa from Access Capital. Please go ahead. <coughs> yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So my question is also on credit card. So, uh, you know, Harjit, you mentioned that uh, of the Murad pool, almost 40% uh, of 45% of the customers are actually new customers. Isn't it a bit worrying that, uh, you know, even after four months uh, of uh, recovery, I guess uh, we may have seen a much lower new number coming in, but still the numbers which are coming in for Morat is uh, fairly high. On people who are not paying are, is fairly high. Yeah. So uh, I think Manish, what you have to keep in mind is credit card is a product where you bill a customer. Uh, customers pay you on due date because there is always uh, a threat of a late payment fee which is levied. When the threat of late payment fee goes away, customers tend to miss their due date. And therefore when they miss their due date, they come into Murat. And then when their card gets blocked, they come back and pay again. That is why you're seeing a big churn happen and you're not seeing sticky customers who just continue to remain in Murat. Very good. That is the main reason why you will see this. So I am not worried about people suddenly in the month of June or July come in uh, on Murad because I know that they will also exit Murad very easily. So if you look at it with every sub, if today I say that in my total Murad pool, 60% are uh, customers from Murad 1, which means the others are coming and going very fast. And therefore I'm not that worried about that. But yeah, you will have a situation till you don't levy the usual threat of late fee, uh, customers today, I mean, will pay as and when they remember to pay. Okay, so basically what you're saying is these are the customers who are just uh, simply choosing not to pay. We are classifying them as Morat and when we go out and engage with them or you, you apply some fees or something, uh, they may come back and pay something. Yeah, so they, we don't apply a fee. See, what happens is they miss their due date after the grace period, the card gets blocked. The customer is intimated since you missed your card is blocked. Therefore, a lot of those customers then come back and make a payment and therefore the card gets open again. Now, in this period, when they don't make a payment, it gets counted as Murat. But when I give you a Murat number, let's say 22%, uh, 21%, I'm basically saying is at the end of June, 21% of balances were not paid 
which means from these 11% customers, I did not receive a payment in the month of June. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and how are you defining active customers? Guys who are in Morat uh, are no longer active customers, is that? No, no. no. So people who transacted in the last 30 days are active. So a, a, a customer in Morat, since the card is blocked, cannot transact and therefore they're not. That's why I said adjusted for Morat, we are only about 5-6% down uh, in terms of active rate. But people who are active are now spending as much as what they were spending in quarter four. Okay. And just to read from the first Morat, 54% uh, of the people are in Morat too. So uh, if the first Morat was uh, say 24% and 54% uh, of that is say 12, 13%, uh, 12, uh, those guys have not paid at all uh, till over the last four or five months. That is right. And you will bucket that as uh, as uh, some sort of a high risk customers now or you think that they can... Uh... No, so they're already bucketed as high risk field collections uh, are going, but understand that we cannot use uh, the usual intensity till the moratorium is on, because that's the uh, you know uh, I mean that's that's the regulatory guidance which has been given that till that period of time, while we go educate them, we speak to them, we try and coax them and show them the costs associated with moratorium. Uh, but if they choose not to pay, that's their right. Uh, Therefore, once the moratorium ends, these will automatically, uh, the intensity on these customers will increase because they are the ones which are the most risky, the way we see it amongst all the moratorium customers. And as you are saying, some part of that customer base will probably become NPS, most likely in the December quarter. That is right. Actually, you will see more in the quarter after that, which is the Jan to March quarter. Because even if they make one payment in between, uh, they will not become an NPA. So, uh, okay. okay. And just a small question on the staff cost. In this quarter, that number has actually gone up. Uh, uh, any one of them? Ideally, I think for every bank, we're seeing that number either remaining flat or decline. Uh, so, money is very pure. We start the year with some sort of provisioning on bonuses and gratuity and other uh, costs which are more. Uh, provisioning oriented rather than actual cost where we typically start with being conservative in the beginning of the year. So that is the primary reason plus of course uh, certain hires which were done in March. We are a growing bank. We have expanded our branches. So all of those additions have also come in. People have joined. We are happy to kind of take people in Morat uh, as we have committed uh, and, and that is also added to it. So number of people today are higher than uh, what were there in the last quarter. <clears throat> So we should assume this is a run rate, as in this kind of a number will continue. Yes. yes. Okay. And the other OPEX, uh, I believe, uh, purely because of lack of activity, uh, and as activity picks up, this number also starts going up, right? The other operating expenses? Yes. So uh, substantially, the reduction on uh, other OPEX uh, is actually, from a variable standpoint, is more than what you see in the final outcome because there will be some incremental increase also. So uh, the the variable new business oriented, especially retail, is is down by more than 100 crores. Uh, but there is some compensating uh, general increases also. But yes, that will come back as and when uh, business origination happens uh, at some pace. <clears throat> okay. Cool. Thank, thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Manish. Thank you. Let's we take the next question from the line on Deshaun Shah from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. A uh, few more questions on credit cards, all some conceptual queries. Uh, so, uh, a payment for a credit card is defined as just that uh, anything above the minimum 5% that requires to be paid, right? So, if I have a revolver balance of, say, whatever, uh, XYZ, 30,000 rupees. 5% of that if I pay, I am out of Morat. I am now able to uh, transact using my card. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. So so uh, for the cards that are under Morat, uh, you don't necessarily ask them to clear the entire balance for them to be able to start using their cards again. Look at it this way. When you take a loan, your EMI is 5% of the loan amount. Mm -hmm. Right. That is what you demand and that is what you pay. 
as a credit card i demand only 5% it is the choice of the customer if he wants to pay the full amount or anywhere in between hmm. so contractually he is supposed to pay me the minimum amount due which is what i am asking for even in normal times uh, uh, yeah even in normal times and that is fair so if the customer continues to pay me even if it is the minimum amount due he is out of morale Perfect. Okay. Okay. Five percent. So we, we, you know, a lot many times, a lot of us get confused with this five percent. A normal loan EMI payment is also five percent. Yep. Yep. Got that. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, second question uh, on slide thirty-nine. You've given uh, advances breakup of your credit cards uh, for the month of April, May, and June. So I'm kind kind of surprised that the mix has not really changed quite materially. Like you know. Uh, um, Uh, ideally i would have thought that the transactor uh, balances would have gone down by a little bit more uh, and the uh, perhaps like a, a disproportionate kind of an increase in the revolver and the term balances uh, because your spends will go down and transactors go down first it, it's not as intense of a drop as you would have expected there's still a 7% uh, kind of a mixed drop uh, could you explain probably why that is like why uh, is like you know a month on month between 4q and uh, uh, the month of april uh, the increase only about 600 basis points in the revolver pool see two things happen one is that the spends themselves are depressed so when mm-hmm. the spends are depressed the number of customers who normally would revolve would go down and therefore what you are seeing here is on account of the moratorium mm-hmm. uh, because the moratorium customer is therefore accruing interest and is being treated as a revolve balance but look at two things one the number of active customers have gone down okay? mm-hmm. and hence hence that's also therefore bring down the revolve balances and the spends itself has gone down so that's the mix which is at play but if you look at it i mean to me uh, 31% of our revolve balance let's say in q4 uh, went up to 37 mm-hmm. and then came down to 34 uh, in june uh that is when the moratorium also came down so it's 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 a direct correlation to the moratorium which is happening correct okay fair enough uh, makes sense um and just in general on say for example microfinance this is a very separate question uh when you classify someone out of morat you uh, are including that month's billing or are you including the backlog as well like if someone's not paid for the month of april may and june do they have to clear the entire balance or just the month of june and the remaining is just uh, adjusted in the principal amount outstanding so understand that if a customer let's say is a taken morat the emis are no longer due the emis have been pushed forward by that period so if a customer pays voluntarily it goes and gets applied to the first due which was there uh, hmm. which is let's say in this case april mhm okay uh, as long as the customer begins the cycle Mm-hmm. of payment we take them out of morat because they are now paying but the emi dues are still later the emi mm-hmm. are still not due so if a customer pays me back in july mm-hmm. okay the emi was is, is due 3 months hence correct fair enough so so, so the principal i'm going to apply that to if is already the june month emi applied to april the july month emi which they pay will get applied to me perfect it's got it i just one last question uh, what is the component of uh, corporate spends in your total spends nothing zero so it's 100% yeah. retail yes perfect yeah that's it from me thank you so much thank you thank you we take the next question from the line of mb mahesh from kodak securities please go ahead good evening uh, just okay. three questions from my three questions from my side one uh, uh, have you uh, when you when you indicated that uh, the customers uh, who are in moratorium has seen uh, you kind of classified it under the revolver yeah so that i i don't classify moratorium customers as revolver but when you split your book uh, customers who are paying you interest on a non term book automatically become revolvers and therefore uh, a moratorium customer who's therefore uh, accruing interest will become a will be treated as a revolving balance Sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, so, see, for example, if I go to that slide, uh, you in slide thirty-nine, thirty-one yes. has gone to thirty-seven for the month of yes. from March to April, and our moratorium book was about twenty-two percent by value. Uh, 
just trying to just kind of figure out what what has happened here that's uh, just the first question mm. and just to kind of extend this discussion uh, this 22% where has it come mostly is it come from the term side or has it come from the transaction yeah so the 22% will have a mix of uh, uh, first understand what what 22% balance is will have a mix of revolvers and transactors uh, sorry revolvers and term right a customer has both term and revolving balances yeah okay so that split roughly is 65 35 65% revolving balances 35% term balances perfect okay perfect. now your your second question was no, then this is more or less is like it answers the, the bulk of it. Okay. Just to just to give extend this question, uh, if the customer watch in revolve, um, have you kind of uh, 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 kind of uh, kind of stepped into the portfolio and said that look, why don't you just kind of move it into a term book as well? Yes. So yes. when I look at repayment, you're doing roughly about uh, thousand six hundred or close of repayments every every month. Uh, would you include a transaction from a revolve to term as a repayment as well? No, no, no. no. We will not include it as a repayment. That will, uh, but we do offer what we call as balance transfers Correct. to customers who may want to convert their entire outstanding into a lower rate term loan. Correct. That is offered, yes. That's not repayment. That's not repayment. That is, is that not a repayment? No. Okay, perfect. And one sli the clarification just to finish off on the card. Uh, the trends that you're seeing today of customers, how are they across customer segments? Uh, have you seen one of the challenges that one has is that uh, a card can be issued both at all at all segments of the population. Where has the trend picked up for you? Uh, do you think it's a risky trend or a less risky trend? Yeah, so uh, if I can just take you to slide 43. Okay. Okay, uh, we've, we've classified spends into daily spends, discretionary spends, and travel and cash. Yes. Okay, uh, and, and roughly the, uh, let's say March mix we've given you 78% were daily spend, 17% were discretionary, and 5% were travel and cash. Okay, now in the recovery phase, which is let's say July first half, uh, in terms of 85% of that value spends are back. 93% of the discretionary spends are back. Uh, what are still not back? Travel and cash is not back, which is which is understandable. I think the ones which need to still pick up uh, are areas like fuel, cabs, dining, food delivery. Uh, these are still not at the levels which they were before, and those are the ones which need to come back a little more. Sorry, my question was the other way around. Uh, the customers who spent it, uh, how is the quality of the customers who are spending it? The customers who are spending it, look at it this way. Uh, there are no Murat customers in this. So the balanced customers are in any case the good quality customers uh, which are not seeing any stress. And they are the ones who are spending this. So in any case, the customers who are spending this are good customers. Okay. Uh, sorry, just, uh, just one last question from my side. Uh, this is, uh, I think, on the deposit side. Uh, this all understand you've done a very good job on kind of just kind of addressing that key concern which was sitting in the month of uh, March. If you could just kind of broadly give us some color, uh, this deposit mobilization that you're doing today on the on the retail and also to some extent on the wholesale side, how was the duration of the book uh, of those deposits looking like as compared to where you were probably a, you know a few months back, and how sticky are these deposits that you are able to originate today? That would be awesome. I'll start. You can continue. Yeah, I, I'll an try to start answering that, and then Surinder can chip in. First of all, uh, on two fronts, there has been positive movement. One is that the bulkier deposits, which are also relatively higher cost deposits, have have been, uh, you know, we have been working on bringing them down, and the more granular retail stuff, we have been working on increasing that. And in that endeavor, we have seen very good traction, very positive traction, which is a very, very good sign, you know. And that is why stuff like Kata in both absolute percentage terms, etc., is going up. So that's the first, if I may say, trend, which is a very positive trend. The second is that more and more people are coming forward now on their own, despite some of the rates that we brought down, you know. And that deposit traction is continuing even at lower rates. So we 
Our second attempt was to first reduce the bulky ones, and also the second trend was to see whether at even lower rates that percentage of growth can be sustained, and that also is happening. So both are positive signs, you know, from that point of view. What is the third point of the question? Duration. 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 Uh, stickiness. stickiness. So that duration is also headed in the right direction. Am, am I right? So, uh, so, uh, so Mahesh, uh, basically uh, we've accreted almost uh, entire increase at a net level, uh, Q1 over Q4 through retail. And typically retail comes in the two-year uh, to three year bucket, which is where we are, uh, we've been offering our, let's say, the peak rate. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, June 30th over March 31st, we've increased duration of deposits. And as compared to where you are probably a few months back, is it back to those levels? Better. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, yeah. Give some more color for the retail book in particular. Uh, we have improved both on the granularity side, vis a vis say a last June or a last December, as well as the tenure side. No, perfect. That's easy. Thanks a lot. So, Mahesh, I mean, just to add, I don't think we are resisting clearly the temptation of going short on uh, to reduce the cost of funds. No, the question was actually just to just to see the stickiness of the deposit. It's actually the other way around. So, yeah. Because at this point of time, I don't think the margins is an issue. We're just kind of looking at the stickiness of the deposit. Yeah, so, 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 so many other parameters. First, like Jerry also mentioned, the tenure is one up. We are getting now 85% of our deposits on the retail side, which are above one year. Uh, on the granularity side, our less than five crores deposits has gone up to 66% on the retail side, which was about 60 odd percent last June. The same trend is visible on the CASA side as well. So, and if you look at the individual entity, which is the, clearly the, uh, uh, the stickiest segment, so to say, even that has gone up significantly as an entity proportion to the overall mix. On the retail side, we have now started garnering about 30, 35 crores a day on our branch network, which is absolutely retail, retail deposits. I mean, it's less than 10 lakhs, for example. That's the kind of granular deposits that we've gone down to. So concerted you efforts. The level yes, so concerted efforts on making sure that the retail uh, proportion to the overall business goes up, cost of deposits come down, and tenure goes up as well. And given Perfect. the fact that we added a few branches last year, about 60 odd, which are fully operational now, and another 20 odd, which are almost ready, which will get operational now. This proportion is only going to improve from here. Perfect. This is useful. Thanks a lot. Next question. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Saurabh Kumar from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. The real estate book, uh, what will be the moratorium? And secondly, on the book, uh, how much standard asset provisions do you have now? What are the books? Yeah, see, the, of the real estate portfolio, it's about 0.7%. Uh, high quality, sir, but we are not over it. I mean, of the book, overall book, it's 0.7% uh, on the real estate uh, market. Sorry, what is the second question? So, real estate moratorium. So, real estate moratorium as a percentage of the, of the total book is 0.7%. Of the wholesale advances is 0.7%. And uh, these are good names, uh, not uh, people preserving liquidity. Okay. Okay. And secondly, sir, on the standard asset? So, so, what is the question on standard asset? Right Total standard asset provisioning on the book, including this 63 basis point. I mean, so I'm just wondering the 63 basis point is part of the standard asset, right? The COVID-19 yeah, yeah. provisioning. Yes. Uh, that should so the be total about, uh, yeah. 100 basis points. Uh, so, yeah, correct. About 100 basis points will be a standard. No, it's about, a, about 85. 100 basis points. Yeah, sorry, about 100 basis points. Yeah. Total standard assets, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks.
Thank you. Next question is from the line of Chirag Sureka from DSP Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Sir, uh, thank you. Uh, I know it's been a long call. Uh, just two quick questions. On the microfinance book, you said 23% uh, are in moratorium, but 95% of the uh, meetings are happening. So what is the flavor you get from those customers? Are they just uh, having a tendency, uh, cash flow mismatch and they'll come back? And so some color on how you think uh, the next few months is going to be the session number one. So quickly, question number two is on the deposit. So it's alluded to the previous stickiness. Uh, the customers who move to you, uh, where do they move from? I mean, is it like a new salary account or it is probably more sticky than, let's say, uh, somebody moving in for higher rates and then uh, later on when the market turns, they go somewhere else. So the stickiness confidence and uh, if you could give a secret thought there, that would be useful. Thank you. So I'll start with the microfinance one. Uh, I think the you have to understand that while technically rural areas do not have infections, you still have restrictions in terms of holding uh, large center meetings in rural areas, which is where the most of the discussion typically happens. So sometimes in some of these meetings, you contact the center leader. The center leader therefore gets in touch with all the other members, and she therefore then collects from them and gives it back. Uh, to your loan officer who goes and uh, uh, does that. Uh, our, our feedback, as I said, was that the business had started. So I don't think there is uh, much which is happening there. Also, customers have understood that they have Murat, but because uh, of the interest issue, they want to start uh, repaying early. Some of them are uh, also paying in installments. Uh, so, for example, they may not pay their full EMI at one go, but during the month in two or uh, or installments, they would uh, pay their EMI. So that's the flavor which one is seeing. Uh, there have some markets, especially in Assam uh, and West Bengal, some districts which were Assam because of floods, West Bengal because of the Amphan uh, piece which happened, and a few districts uh, in Bihar now, which are again impacted by the floods, is where while the center meetings and the contact is happening, yet collections has taken a little bit of a pause, which will start again once the flood water recedes. But people seem to have the money. On the deposit side, uh, uh, there were two, three points that I wanted to mention. First, uh, as a general routine business has, in the months of June and July, almost returned to us opening about, on the physical side, about 80% of the account that we were opening earlier. But on the digital side, we've actually ramped up significantly from our last quarter business. So we used to do about 100, 150 accounts a day on the digital side, and we now go up to 450, 500 a day. And all of these digital accounts, because that's how we enabled, are essentially individuals. So clearly there is a significant shift happening in the entity mix that we are generating now. That's point number one. Point number two is, the stickiness, as you mentioned, really comes from the fact that you're not only just opening an account of an individual, you're making sure that at the same time you're doing multiple other products and channel engagement with the client as well. So we have a very focused effort around product holding and channel engagement. And we don't look at an FD customer only as a customer in the first place. We don't only sell an FD. We first sell a CASA account and then start to open FDs. Uh, point number three is that when we say that the deposits have come back, all the time deposit accretion that's happened in the last three months has essentially come from CASA customers, essentially. So, you know, the same customer has increased his wallet size with us. And since he's a retail customer and we're looking for very small values, it's going to help on the deposit side, and it also help, helps on the CASA side in the long run as well. So that has been our focus. On the new acquisition side, We've had a very long-term strategy around making sure that we look at the NR customers, the salary customers, and high net worth individuals in and around our geography catchments. And I think that clearly continues to be one of our biggest strategies. And our customers are really coming in from almost all the banks, but clearly, you know, that mix has not changed. But our penetration and productivity with our branches and our people going up has improved drastically. So the mix is good and same as earlier. The number has come back, and now we're selling more within the same customer base as well. Okay. 
So, so thank you. So what you're saying is, if it becomes a transacting account, uh, the stickiness increases, and that's what they're doing. They're processing a lot of things from the account, and uh, that's what they're doing. Absolutely right. Okay, thanks. Good to know, sir, and good luck. And one another indicator, uh, very small one, our mobile banking penetration has gone up by about 70% since last year. Our FD unique penetration has gone up by about two percentage basis points on the overall base. And and that's like really changing the way the stickiness is improving. Thank you. We take the last question from the line of Saurabh Dole from Travantage Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, sir, thank you and uh, good evening. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, could I have the number of cards uh, that you may have blocked and uh, which are, you know, out, out of your moratorium period, out of the moratorium book? Cards blocked out of the moratorium, that would not be a very large number. We have reduced limits, but yeah. uh, blocking, blocking would be for customers who have not paid. Okay, and reduced limit would be for what proportion of that portfolio? Unblocked so portfolio? If I, if I was to see, the reduction in limits is something we've been doing for the last two, three quarters. Uh, all in all put together, this will be close to about 150 uh, to 200,000 customers over the last, let's say, three quarters. Okay, okay, okay. And so on this, uh, on... Uh, the second question was on the MFI business. If I remember correctly, you said that during the month of April and May, you did not make even any top-up loans. Is that right? Even in the month of June, we did not make any top-up loans. Yeah. So actually, uh, when we were listening to a few other players, they said that because the segment is so vulnerable, they were selectively giving top-up loans. So I'm a little curious to know as to what risk do you have you know, by not giving top-up loans to this segment because you may risk losing those customers, right? No, so the way it happens is, look, uh, we wanted to, therefore, get a good insight into which customer is paying you because they have enough cash flows and they would do it uh, and not get influenced by the fact that there is a top-up loan which is coming, so therefore let me just pay one installment and I'll get my top-up loan. Right. So ultimately, a top-up loan... Uh, the installment which the customer is paying is only a fraction of the top of loan which the customer is getting. So we consciously took a call that at least for the month of June, uh, we will wait out and see how many customers start paying and show uh, intention to pay. And therefore now we will start doing uh, or have already started doing uh, disbursals, both top ups and renewals. Uh, and in some markets, uh, even new uh, businesses uh, in the microfinance space. Okay. But it's still 30% of our normal run rate. Right, sir. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Well, we now conclude the Q&A session. If you have any further questions, please contact RBL Bank Limited via email at ir at the rate rblbank.com. I repeat the email ID ir at the rate rblbank.com. On behalf of RBL Bank Limited, we thank you all for joining this evening. You may now disconnect your line. Thank you. Thank you.